Hello everyone, this is Coach Carol and welcome to our keynote number two on the second day of Aussie Live 2015. I'm delighted to have Connie Malamed with us today who is going to take us into a little journey about the future is now learning technology tools. First, let's give thanks to our sponsors and supporters because this is a totally voluntary event. This is the second. Uh, we run our community all year but we run our Aussie Live only once each year and takes a bit of doing. We've had a lot of flurry in the background with people getting ready and quite often uh, people feel that they're presenting to an empty room but we record everything so that people who are unable to join us on the actual time can view it later. So Australia E-Series is the team and we've been going for several years now and we're really grateful to Steve Hargaden in America for loaning us the Blackboard Collaborate Rooms. So we recently joined the Learning Revolution Project as one of his protégés and we give them a great deal of thanks for the use of the Blackboard Collaborate Room. We do normally put our locations here on board so you can see we have Connie over here in the USA and I'm sure she'll tell us exactly where she is when she comes onto the microphone and Ness and I are down south here or oh, I'm in the south part of Australia and Ness is up here in New South Wales or is it Queensland this morning, I'm not sure. And I'm not sure that Linda is actually hearing us but if you are able to hear just let us know in the text chat. Our slides are all loaded and we're ready for the future. So can I ask Connie to switch on her microphone by clicking the talk button and take it away. Hello everyone and people who will be watching this recording in the future. Uh, thanks for being here and actually I am not too far from Washington DC, that's where I'm located so it's, it's kind of great to be talking to people in Australia and around the world. In terms of uh, speaking about learning technology trends, have you noticed that there's been an amazing change, almost a seismic change in our technologies? You can see it and read it and hear about it everywhere in the training and in the education world. We're in the midst of a powerful convergence. There's a coming together of new technologies with mind shifts and how we think about training and education. So what's driving this change? Well, one of the things, there are many things coming together that are converging and one of them is the amount of information that we continue to create, humans just continue to create and now they measure it in exabytes and they say that a few years ago they were saying that we've already created 988 exabytes of information and of course I'd never heard of that either. One exabyte equals one billion gigabytes. And another fact that we have to deal with is that the information exists in many different formats simply because it can. So if you're a teacher, you have to wonder how will future workers make sense of all this media? And if you're a trainer in the workplace, the same thing. How can people make sense of all of this media? It's in all kinds of different formats. And another thing that's converging is the speed at which knowledge change, changes. It's almost impossible for one person to be an expert in everything because knowledge, in fact it is impossible because knowledge just continues to change. So how will your workforce continually update their skills and knowledge? And if you're a teacher, how can you prepare students to be ready to continually change what they need to know to be able to work? There's a new generation entering the workforce and how we, we meet the demands of plugged in employees. In the book, The 2020 Workplace, the author said, never has a generation entered the workplace using technologies so far ahead as those adopted by its employer. So people are coming into the workplace who are more knowledgeable with technology than the actual workplace where they're, where they're employed. Some other drivers that are causing this technology 
uh, cha all these changes is that we now have most people or many people have ubiquitous internet. It's always on and we have access anywhere and at any time. We also have of an explosion of software as a service. All those pieces, all that software that's in the cloud, all of those programs have changed everything because now we can access whatever we want wherever we are. The rise of social media has really changed things because people expect everyone to be transparent. And the rapid adoption of mobile, no one thought that, it would, that so many people would have smartphones. There are 1.2 billion mobile web users worldwide. And for many people who were the internet service is poor or where they can't afford a computer around the world, they use their telephone, their, their mobile phone, as their way of accessing the internet. The other big change that's been happening is in the workforce and in schools, people realize that learning is more than a one-time event. You can't just give people one lesson or one e-learning course and think that that's going to be enough. Research has shown that this doesn't work. And in the workplace, there's a real breaking down of the top-down structure. There's also a realization that knowledge is a connected network and that this network is more important than the knowledge itself. And finally, one thing that really exploded the w world of workplace training is, was the discovery that people mostly learn through informal means. So what we're going to look at are six, or actually five, uh, technologies that have kind of emerged out of all of these different social and technological drivers and what this means for training and for education. Let's look at social media learning. Social learning is it's often confused with, but it's not quite the same thing. With social learning, it's any learning that occurs socially through relevant collaboration or discussion. But social media learning is using social media platforms to support learning. So this can include the use of public and private social media sites and platforms, kind of like this one right now. 65% of online adults use social networking. And 70% of workplace learning, or up to 70%, happens informally. So these are very, very important statistics to realize how much education and training are, are evolving and changing. And whenever there's a new and disruptive technology, there's initially a backlash against it before it becomes broadly accepted. So a lot of times in the workplace, employers will say that they don't want people using social media. And that often happens in the uh, in higher ed, too, maybe a professor might see students on their phones and they don't know if they're texting or if they're really, you know, looking up information. So there's often a backlash against using it in education and training. People are concerned about security breaches, about reduction in productivity, loss of control, uh, ruined reputations, that somebody might tweet something in a company that would ruin their reputation, and also that social learning or social media can be a waste of time and money. But the reason that it's a good thing and the positive benefits are from it are that um, the increased contact and the improved communication between employees is actually a plus and it can actually help get things done in a more productive way. And in education, it can help students learn to collaborate. Knowledge workers spend between six and ten hours a week hunting for information. But when you use social media to learn, you can use it to identify experts, you can use it to speed up knowledge sharing, to increase innovation, to improve productivity, and to uh, increase employee retention because when people can easily find the information they need from other experts or from experts, it makes them less frustrated, so it makes work more fun. Here's an example of how social media can, can be helpful in the workplace. For example, everyone in a large workplace can actually put up a profile of themselves. It's, in particular, imagine a corporation or an organization that's international where there are people from all over the world setting up their profiles. Then when one person says, I need to know how to set up a webinar, someone, they can just look up in their social, in their company's social media program and find someone who can help them with it. 
That saves a lot of time and it saves money. Some of the things that you can do in educational situations and in the workplace are to use chat rooms for remediation, host podcast interviews with experts, share knowledge through blogging, use the Twitter stream to get uh, links to important resources, take polls during a live event, create a wiki to document new software, start or join a community of practice, and share resources on a forum. These are all things that the workplace can do with social media. And here's an example. The comp a company named Unisys, um, it's a 130-year-old company with a tech, it's a technology firm with 23,000 employees, and they decided that they wanted to use social media tools to become more agile, to share knowledge, to improve productivity, and to increase the speed of innovation. So here is how they did it, and they got it to really work. The CEO was an early adopter and role model. That's important. So you have someone at the very top supporting this. They created an advisory council that created a shared vision for how are we going to go social. They created software called MySite where employees built personal credentials and created a network of colleagues. They also created a program called Ask Me where employees could locate experts across the organization using hashtags. And within 18 months, 15,000 Unisys employees built profiles and created hashtags describing their expertise. This saved the company a lot of time and they were no longer frustrated, you know, not being able to get the answers to questions. Now, another kind of uh, important way that we can go about improving learning and enhancing learning through technology is by teaching people how to create personal learning environments. A personal learning environment, you probably all have one already. It's a network of services, tools, and people necessary for ongoing learning that is controlled by the individual rather than being controlled by the teacher, by the boss, by the manager, by the professor. It's something that the individual controls. And when you think about it, why not leverage what already exists? There's so much information out there. For example, 300 hours of video are uploaded to YouTube every minute. This is a statistic from this year. There are 230 million Twitter accounts. <laughs> there are over 1,890,000 interest groups on LinkedIn. And if you're not part of one of those interest groups, you'll see that if you join one, there are some really great, discru uh, great discussions. I know I'm part of some for e-learning and instructional design. And Carol is saying these numbers are growing exponentially, and they really are, because I had numbers from two years ago here at first, and I had to uh, replace them, and they have grown exponentially. So personal learning environment is self-directed. It involves using a multitude of tools, whatever tools will work for the individual. It's not centralized. It provides a social context for sharing knowledge, for collaboration, and for creating content. For example, a blog is for creating content, sharing content, but also learning from others. It's very personal and individualized. And these are some of the types of tools that you can use to create your own personal learning environment. Now, I'm guessing that most people watching this have some of a, what of a personal learning environment already. And why don't you try considering some of these to expand your options? I see that Ness is saying, oh, yes. So how can you support a personal learning environment in the workplace and perhaps to some extent in the classroom? Well, you can create a culture of learning. You can demonstrate the value of personal learning environments by demonstrating them to people and showing them the cool things and the interesting things and the valuable things that you found. You can introduce appropriate tools that are relevant to work and relevant to school. You can help employees create their own personal learning environments. Give, uh, you know, a, one, a lunch session on it. You can provide opportunities to share new tools. For, for example, in some workplaces, they might have a lunchtime session and people will um, get up and talk about the most, you know, the coolest tools that they found and how, and how much they're helping them. 
And also you can encourage early adopters to use the tools and then spread the word. A lot of times the best way to spread the idea of technology in an organization is to get some people who are really you know, evan evangelicals and they create a lot of buzz and get other people interested. Now let's look at content curation. How many people here know what content curation is? You can answer in the chat if you're familiar with it. <laughs> Someone says they're certainly an evangelist. Yes. Okay. So content curation is the selecting, organizing, and presenting digital content associated with a specific subject area to add value and give it meaning. So rather than always creating courses, people can just curate content and take advantage of what's already out there. This is different than that automatic content aggregation. Content curation takes me to the human touch. So I always think of content curation as being similar, or the content curator as being similar to the uh, curator of an art gallery, where you find information, you filter it, and you only pick out the best. Then you organize it in a way that's easy for people to learn from. And then you annotate it. And the reason that you annotate it is you have to give it some context if you want to do a really good job at, at curation. In particular, if you're going to have it replace a course, you would annotate it and say why you thought it was important and um, why someone else might find it valuable, what to look for in the article, those kinds of things. So here are a few examples, and this is what Carol uses. Uh, she uses Scoop It, and notice in this Scoop It one, in this Scoop It curated page, that um, the person who curated it, uh, Michael Verstreppen, also put a little bit of annotation in there. I, know it, I have it circled in red. I notice that each one has, you know. An annotation, which said, you know, which lets you know, oh, this article would be good for me. Uh, this article wouldn't. This article, this is why I want to read it. So that's a great idea to, to use a tool that annotates. Now I'm not sure if you can do annotation in this next tool. It's called, it's called Zeef. And Tracy Parrish has come up with a great list of e-learning tools that would be good for education and workplace training. And I don't see a place for annotation, but it certainly allows you to organize and categorize, and that's also helpful. So if anyone is interested in this, look up Tracy Parrish's uh, curated list of tools. It's very good. So these are some of the advantages of content curation. First of all, it provides meaning to disorganized information because when you just look something up in Google search or whatever uh, search engine you use, the information isn't really organized and you have no idea which link is going to be helpful for you and which one isn't. So when you curate content for people or when you go to other people's uh, curated content, it's already organized in a meaningful way if they're doing a good job. Um, essentially, it picks up where search engines leave off. And there is the potential for building community. You can have a lot of people come and discuss and use your page and leave comments. Um, I just thought, I thought I'd slow down for a second here with the content curation. I was going top speed for a little while there. And uh, anyone in the audience, can you tell me if there are, uh, what advantages you have found for if, if you are doing curation or if you look at other people's Sites. What do you like about it? You can answer in chat. Um, Vanessa says she likes the, that, it's, that it's all organized, right? I like that too. You can go there for one topic. It saves time. Being able to find what I need when I need it. That's pretty much what, what's so good about it. <laughs> Everything's all in one place, but then it's a portal to many other things. Yeah, that's a good way of looking at it as a portal. That's true. Um, Carol says it bounces ideas off of my, it's a way to bounce ideas off of her personal learning environment. Yeah, that's another good point. 
So content curation is really cool. And I know in the world of training and workplace training, people are getting pretty tired of having to take, uh, you know, 30 compliance e-learning courses and then another 10 for, you know, other things. So that um, if you can curate content and give people the same information, it's much, it becomes much more interesting because you can include videos and podcasts and things like that. Also, someone was saying um, it sends stuff virally, and it becomes a network. Yeah, those are all those are all some of the benefits and advantages of content curation. Now let's look at the back channel. This is really interesting. The back channel kind of started out meaning the communication that was going on during a conference. So have you ever been to a conference and perhaps you tweet something that's interesting or you text a friend who's at the conference or even um, who's not at the conference and you might say, oh, wow, so-and-so said this. Well, that was what the back channel originally was. It was a way, it was a second line of communication. So the presenter was presenting to the audience on one level and on the back channel, the participants were uh, communicating with each other or with others who weren't there. Well, now a lot of people started blogging at events, kind of live blogging at them, and also writing articles and related topics to something they might have seen at a conference. So now the back channel includes the entire world of any any resources and information that were about that particular conference or event. And the first person I've ever heard do this, and he might be the best person at it, is David Kelly, who now works for, e for the eLearning Guild. And here's an example of his back channel um, for the 2014 Mobile Learning Conference, mLearnCon. And Carol says, we see Twitter feeds being used at conferences now to back channel live presentations. Right. And that's how it all started. But one thing that David has done, it's kind of a mix of back channel and curation. Here's the first half of his page, but I've, if you scroll down, you can see that he's taken all of the related things he can find on the internet about every session and every article written and all the resources that in any way, shape, or form relate to the conference and relate to the topics that were discussed in the conference. And this is a great resource. It's a great, re it's, a, it's a way of curating and it's a way of keeping up with things. And in particular, not everybody can afford the time or the expense of going to every conference. So this is a great way if you feel a little bit bad about missing out that you, you know, you'll essentially get the gist of what, what went on there. Now, another learning technology that um, is related to all of those drivers that I was mentioning at first, the uh, ubiquitous internet, you can get to it at any time. Everyone has a computer in their pocket or in their bag. Um, many people around the world are using mobile only as their only means of accessing the internet. So mobile learning, there are a lot of advantages to it. It's convenient. It can be used globally. You can get information that you need at the moment, right at the moment that you need it. So um, if you're a student, if you are working in a job and you need something, you know, right away, if there's performance, a, a performance support mobile tool for you, you can use that. It's social. It can help people collaborate. Um, it's push and pull, and that means you can get information that you want, and you can sign up for things that push information to you. So that you can pull information in and you can get it pushed to you. For example, people sign up to get notifications for um, to take their medicines or to exercise for health purposes. You can also generate content um, through mobile. For example, imagine someone who's an inspector and the inspector sees uh, a flood in a house. Well, he or she can take a video of it and use that information and send it to new people, new employees, novices, people that you're trying to train on something, and you can generate content 
through your mobile device and teach others. And the other thing about mobile is now there are advanced capabilities with it, such as sensors and geolocation and augmented learning, which we're going to talk about in a little while. So these are some of the considerations you need to think about if you plan on creating mobile in any way, shape, or form. The content should be streamlined. So you can't take e-learning and just make it smaller. Mobile learning is not e-learning on a phone. It has to be something unique and something smaller and something designed for the small screen. You have to make a lot of technical decisions if you're actually trying to make a short mobile learning course. You have to make sure it works on multiple devices or even a, like perhaps a learning portal, like a website that's a learning portal. You should be able to leverage the gestural interface. So on our desktops, we use uh, the graphical user interface, but on phones, we use the gestural interface. You have to learn what all the gestures are and make sure that they're integrated into your program. And you should remember that people tend to use mobile not in long sessions, but in bursts of activity. So some of the things that it's ideal for are mini lessons, very small nuggets of media, like a short video, and all of these I consider micro-learning. And, and mobile is also great for performance support, content at the moment of need, a digital job aid, um, a student reference manual. And it's also good, it's, it can be one of your uh, technologies for a blended, blended learning solution. So here are just a few examples of how people have used mobile to, for, to help people learn. One is a, an app called uh, the Leadership Challenge. And it helps people learn how to be leaders. It provides a little bit of content, and then it gives you exercises to do. And then you, I think you can check in and see how you're doing with your exercises. I saw this other very short, uh, kind of like micro-learning to learn how to do interviews, <coughs> behavioral interviewing. And these are very short videos. So for example, if someone, as I said, people uh, do generally do mobile in bursts of, short bursts of activity. So therefore, you might want to have a two-minute video. Somebody might be sitting in their car, have a little time to kill, they'll watch a two to five minute video, and that's it. That's about as long as people are going to just stare at a small screen. I wanted to show everyone my mobile learning reference app. It's called Instructional Design Guru. And a lot of students and newbies have told me that they like this because they can be sitting in a meeting and there is a list of uh, over 470 terms and you can quickly look something up, or if your um, students have told me they use it in lectures, when people are talking about things or if a client is talking about something that you're not sure what it means, you can quickly look it up. And on some of the words, I added a little bit of, with, with a light bulb down at the bo bottom right, I added a little bit of um, my own personal take on ways to, um, ways to work with it, the term, you know, how to use it. Now finally, we get into ways to annotate the physical world. It's pretty amazing. And perhaps you've heard of the term um, <laughs> oh yes, I remember the term, the Internet of Everything. The Internet of Everything. Uh, and what that means is that at some time in the future, everything is going to be hooked up to each other. You know that now that they have um, appliances with computers in them. You can control your house, your lights with uh, technology. Well, eventually, that's how things are going to be. But right now, you know, the future is now. Right now, we can annotate the physical world through technology. Now, here's an example. You're probably familiar with QR codes. And if not, um, the universal product code. Do they have these in Australia? The universal product code. Do they use these symbols? Anyone? Because we have them all over the United States. Yep. Okay. 
I wondered if you had another version or something. And this is the code that you know has information, all the data is encoded in it, and it gets scanned at checkout. Well, very similar to that is the quick response code or the QR code, except it can, it can contain even more data, and you can see how much more complex that is. So the way you can use QR codes is you can download a QR scanner app to your phone, scan the code with your camera, and the information appears on your phone. And people aren't taking advantage of these as much as they could for learning. I can imagine a classroom with QR codes, they're very easy to make, a, a classroom with QR codes um, all around it, perhaps on the books in the library telling students um, what, uh, what, what the particular book is about or which kids like the book. In workplace learning, you can scan the environment. People can explore and scan the environment for relevant stories. For example, if you're working in a warehouse, maybe there would be a story about something, maybe how someone hurt themselves on this machine and what you can do about it. You can scan a machine for safety information before you start using it. You can scan a brochure for company policies. You can scan a device to learn how to use it. I mean, how many people have had trouble, for example, um, having a copy machine get stuck? Well, perhaps, you know, you could scan the device with, the, with your phone and get information about how to fix it. You can scan books or journal shelves. You can have a, um, a, a journal shelf in the workplace, and when you scan it, you can have hyperlinks to resources that are relevant. <laughs> Carol says her coffee machine constantly tries her patience. And here's some other ways of, um, that the, the physical reality can be, augment, can be annotated. One is augmented reality, which is starting to come into fruition now. It's been mostly prototypes, but now there are some ways that it, can, that it really works. So an augmented reality, or AR system, adds to the physical world by overlaying a virtual scene or more information on top of a real scene. Columbia University in the, sta oh, in the States, I believe it was Columbia, um, did an experiment with Marines, uh, U.S. Marines, on repairing uh, equipment. And they wore, now I, I agree that this, <laughs> the gear does not look very uh, particularly comfortable. It's nothing like Google Glass, right? But they used this augmented reality headgear, and whenever they had to fix something, and that, that picture on the bottom right is an example of what they would see on their, uh, on their equipment. So it would show you exactly what to do, what tool to use, and where to connect it and disconnect it. And it's, it sped up their repair time by 47%. They were able to increase their productivity by 47% wearing the AR gear. That's pretty amazing and, and pretty impressive. And the way it works is that the phone reports the location data if you're using it on a phone. And if you're using it with one of those big devices, I'm guessing that it takes a picture of the of the um, location where you are on the device, on the equipment that you're repairing, and can show you what you should be doing there. And the AR uh, app overlays content related to objects and places in that location. And, if, and you probably know that we have this already. Um, Linda says that she would include a diagram analysis over the images, uh, visualizing the steps in a process. Yep, through step-by-step -step animation rather than reading a manual. That's another good idea. So there's an app called Wikitude, and there are some other ones of these where you can uh, place your phone, point your phone at one area. Your phone picks up the data and overlays information about it. So if you were visiting, um, if you were being a tourist and visiting somewhere, you can get information about that area. They have um, AR apps now that will tell you from your location what real estate is available, what homes and apartments or condos or buildings are, are for sale.
Now let's take a look at the expanded role of training in light of all of these technologies that we've just seen. And I think it really applies to the classroom too, the expanded role of teaching that technology can bring. Don't just adopt technology for anything just because it's cool, but use new learning technologies to solve a real organizational problem. In the workplace, you have to generate a long-term strategy for Enterprise 2.0 and create corresponding policies. And this is also true in education because students and employees can misuse social media if you're trying to use it for education. So you have to have policies that go along with the new technologies. And if you're having trouble getting people to adopt it, you have to team up with a small group of early adopters to create buzz in your organization and then have it grow slowly. And even in the classroom, this could, this could work. You come up with a very cool project and other teachers will see what you've been doing and they may also adopt it and it can spread in that way. You can also be a change agent. You have to, um, educators and instruction designers and trainers I think we have to start thinking of ourselves as change agents because we can often see through our, uh, by seeing the big picture, we can also often see what's wrong with an organization and what needs to get fixed. So you can create a culture of learning rather than a culture of training. You can support learning communities and networks and help them provide real value. And you don't have to be the one, especially if you're in a management position, who actually creates the community. Once you get a community going, you can have other people help you moderate it and bring it to life. You can find ways to organize information and to give it meaning. And you can provide ways for people to quickly get relevant knowledge when they need it through content curation. So I wanted to thank you for having me give this keynote. It was a great opportunity and it was ni it's nice meeting you all and well, I'll take questions in a minute. Um, I just want to tell you about my site, the eLearningCoach.com. There are over 250 articles, um, podcasts, re lots of resources for anyone interested in instruction design training and I even have quite a few teachers who find things of interest here. Perhaps uh, in particular probably the cognition and in the multimedia graphics audio sections. So um, any comments or questions about all the different learning technologies we discussed? Carol says she always advocates others to be change agents and to move outside their comfort zone. That's great. Um, so she's interested in the emerging roles uh, in the learning and development function. Well. I just wrote an article about that. In fact, it's, it's right there in front of you, emerging roles. And I see three roles. One is change agent, and that's the most difficult, in particular if you're new to an organization. But frequently, um, when we're at meetings in the world of instructional design or meeting with clients and we ask a question, all these problems show up that uh, they didn't even realize. For example, we can say, well, what's the policy on that? And they'll say, ooh, we didn't even write the policy yet. Um, and Carol says teachers often do not consider themselves learning designers, but well, the interesting thing is they really can because one of the other roles is being someone who supports learning. So when you support learning, you are really teaching people about tools. And even though children today, you know, are, may, may be digital natives, they don't necessarily know all the tools that an adult will know, and they don't necessarily know the best ways to use them to get information. I mean, they, most kids know you go to Google and you search, but what else? Where else can you find tools? What are the best curation sites? What are the best communities to, to learn about something that you're interested in? So those are some of the, um, some of the types of roles you can support and you can be a change agent. Um, any, anything else? Anyone else? Uh, yeah, I'll just pop in and, and say, Connie, how this is resonating for us, especially after listening to Jane Hart's presentation last night uh, where she was talking about the, the different ways in which we uh, lead and we move beyond e-learning 
and we we use a lot of the tools and of course you know the hundred top tools is often a place that we send our teachers to mm. so what you've done today is is really consolidated into more about the philosophy behind it and to for me especially really resonates for me because of the learning design component and that's how I, I morphed my skills from being an instructor to an instructional designer uh, some years ago and it changed my whole world. Mm. Uh, so I, I wonder uh, if um, other people give you testimonials about what's changed in their education educational domain uh, once they they move into learning design, do you have that on your site? No, I mean I I do have, I, I have a course called Breaking in um, it's at the website breakingintoib.com, and it it's twelve lessons that tell people about the instructional design career and what it's like and what the skills are and the debate about whether you need a degree in it or not and things like that. Um, yep, that's it. I'll, I'll I'll put it in the chat for it quickly. Yeah, that'd be great because I think that was probably one that I took personally. Oh, great! And, and found and found it very very useful. <laughs> so so I would to, advocate it. Okay. Well, what I was going to say, a lot of teachers email me from that and say, well, what do I need? What do I need to know? And although there's a great overlap between teaching, you know, between education and training, or teaching and uh, learning design because teachers might might design um, what they're essentially like what they're going to do that day um, there is also still a um, you know some, something missing like for, for example you might have to learn more learning strategies and instructional strategies and learning theory to um, be able to do the best job as an instructional designer would you say would you agree oh absolutely yes I agree with you totally <laughs> so that might be the part that's missing, and then the other part that's missing, depending on where you're working. If you're working in, um, you know, e-learning and games for education, then you're probably good. But if you need to go to adult learning, um, if you're going into adult learning, then um, what is that? Are you hearing that other voice? All right. No, that's Sorry, okay. that was coming from my iPad. <laughs> I'll turn oh, okay. my talk button off. That's just fine. <laughs> so anyway, um, so, so yeah, go uh, ahead. So then you might need to learn more about uh, adult learning, which the truth is, I don't think it's super different than um, learning for you know, like high schoolers, because just because people, as they get older, they want to know why is this relevant and why do I need to learn it, you know, and that that kind of thing. But you know, I. I I'm, I'm not here to say necessarily that e-learning is dead. I'm here to say e-learning isn't everything. I think we'll, there are still courses that people need. I, I work on courses all the time that I feel like, yep, this needed to be a course, like for medical and for healthcare. So yeah, a lot of those things do need to be courses, but you can also expand. Not everything needs to be a course, and training isn't the solution to every single problem. Thank you so much, Connie. That was excellent, and you finished right on time. Really wonderful to allow us to explore a little bit further with you. So I really appreciate the presentation today. I'm so uh, happy. Thank been, you. <laughs> really, really wonderful to have you sharing your your knowledge and your experience with us this way. And I just wanted to move to uh, the last slide just to remind people that when they exit today, they'll actually be uh, asked for a little uh, feedback on your session and you'll find it too when you exit it immediately sends you to this little survey and that goes directly through to the learning solution and that keeps their records up to date about how each of these have gone so I wanted to uh, thank you again and we'll just give you the round of applause in the usual uh, <laughs> Blackboard collaborate way and uh, we'll be moving across to other rooms and we invite you to join us if you've got time of course you might find for instance if if it works out for you uh, I'm not sure how late it is right now but uh, later today midday Australia time we're listening to Bron Stuckey on um, games and badges so that's mm. uh, another keynote that's coming up 
and uh, if you wanted to join us for another one of these next year, we'd be happy to have you. Please make advantage of joining the community at AussieLive.com. Thank you so much for the invitations and for all of your hard work. Uh, you're very welcome, and thank you again. Sure, take and care. And at this point, we'll close the recording.